Hello friends, welcome to the world of English literature. My name is Amit and today I have with me Azu, who is a research scholar and today we will um, discuss um, this poem called for Anne Gregory by William Butler Yeats. When we talk about love and we talk about this human capability of loving, which is very limited and perhaps can, we can only love based on the outer appearance and we can only love through comparison against what God can do and God can love indefinitely, God can love selflessly. But sir, if we make it about human capability in general, do you think we're being unfair to the very gendered quality of the poem? Because the entire poem talks about a man's love for Anne Gregory. It talks about a heterosexual male affection towards Anne Gregory. What do you think about that? Uh, you raised uh, some very important points over here. And thank you for your question. So first of all, um, coming back to the issue of the narrator, that everything if you see, all the three stanzas are in quotes. So it reflects upon us that we assume that the narrator is a man. A man is being mentioned or men are being mentioned in, in the first two, all three stanzas. But why should the narrator be a man? It could be a woman. Yeah. It could be a, her friend saying, oh, uh, you girl with yellow hair, all the men despairing over you. Hmm. It could be a friend teasing her. It could be an elder woman um, teasing her. Um, it could be her lover teasing her, a woman lover teasing her. Hmm. So they, these are very challenging thoughts, which also reflects upon our own prejudices of how we think of narration of a certain kind of things to be said. Uh, a man wooing a woman would be told only by a man and because it's a male poet is an inherent assumption over here. To the second part of your question about God's ability um, um, to love selflessly but not human ability. So you're very right that um, what I just said dilutes the matter which is gendered. So friends, what I what we mean by gendered over here is that male and female are um, um, neutral categories but men and women are genders. We assume certain things about genders that men will be bodybuilders, not women. That men will be truck drivers, not women. That nurses will be women, not men and so on and so forth. So there is a whole gendered assumption in this when we say human capability to not love. It's what Azu is trying to point out over here is that it is men's capability to not be able to love and not generally human capability. That in this world which is predominantly man's world that they hold power, uh, positions of power in society and in domestic relationships also, they decide what the nature of the beauty would be. So for example, Think about it. What if this were a poem about a man with a golden hair and woman in the first paragraph in despair over the man's golden hair? That does not happen often, isn't it? It is women do not describe men's beauty. It's the other way around. Men describe women's beauty and it's in a certain tradition, a certain color of hair, a certain color of skin, a certain way you look, a certain body type and so on and so forth. So, Azu, you have got a very um, valid point that it is not about human, human love, but it is about men um, framing women in the way they want to see them. And which is why um, all the portraits that you see uh, in 19th century or before, these portraits have very thin, petite um, women and you would never see uh, anybody fat or plump or out of shape, etc. Yeah. Not to say that men or boys these days don't face body image problems or they don't have to live up to certain stereotypes or beauty standards because I believe that's also something we should talk about with the students here. Because, mm, definitely. Um, yeah, because even men these days are subjected to certain beauty standards. They have to be in a certain physique, they have to look a certain way, have to have certain kind of hair. And all of this, students, is mostly cultural projection is what I have to say because what we see on screens, what we see idealized, a certain kind of hero, a certain kind of sports personality that we really like and then we try to mimic that person. Absolutely. And if we fall short, it becomes a reason for despair like you were talking earlier. Exactly and leads to a lot of anxiety and, and which is why it's important to uh, value oneself for what 
one is intrinsically worth to discover one's own qualities rather than given to peer pressure or to build your muscles and look a certain way or something like that. We should recognize our own qualities. Somebody could be a poet, somebody could be a singer and so on and so forth. Good, so let, let us look at the <coughs> themes which we have largely looked yeah. at but to tie up, to summarize and um, tie them thematically. So one of the most important themes which we have been um, discussing all through is um, the love for beauty, which yeah. is what we have, whether it is external or internal. Yeah. That is the whole um, conflict with the, a question which is posed in the first stanza, a protest by the girl in the second, and it is sort of resolved in a very um, fuzzy way by quoting a religious man reading from a text um, saying that it, it is only God's business to uh, love. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's also interesting why we have this conflict between the external and the internal. It's important to also ask why can't it coexist? Why can't love be also for the external and for the internal? Why does it always have to be these two different things? And when we talk about this dichotomy of sorts, we're also making this dichotomy between not just male and female, not just internal and external, but also man and God, like it ties up in the last stanza. So it's also interesting students to note why is it that we think in these categories and why is it that Anne Gregory has to erase a part of herself in order to hope that someone would love her for who she is on the inside. When in the middle stanza she talks about changing her hair color, we can understand it also as self-effacement. What mm -hmm. do you think about that, sir? Um, yeah, and these kind of binaries, so these are binaries where you create two categories, white and black, man and woman, man and God, etc. And then our entire life seems to be revolving around this or that and not what can lie in between. So what Azu is trying to say over here is that is it possible that we can um, love Anne Gregory for her external beauty as well as her internal beauty? Why does it have to be that her external beauty has to be stripped for her to test men whether they will still fall in love with her or not? Why can't men also love both the qualities? Um, so the next theme is the feminist point of view, which would also be a new idea um, for students. A feminist point of view is when we try to look at a work of art or writing through the lens of understanding through what a woman's point of view would be and how, what the power equations in the world between men and women are and how to balance it out, how to even it out. So as we have been discussing, it has propped up again and again in our discussion is that um, in the second stanza we see clearly the woman's protest. The first stanza as you can see is very sweet. How can one not help falling in love with your yellow hair? So it's like a, a regular love song that you uh, listen to on radio or see on, on the television and suddenly there's a change in tone with a girl protesting it and saying but what if my hair color was different? Would you would these men still love me? Um, and so uh, she brings forth a very important feminist point of view, which as we pointed out, is also uh, aligned to uh, understanding other forms of discrimination, how we discri discriminate against other races, or um, there's caste-based discrimination as well, or various form forms of discrimination, people with disability, do we, does everybody get equal opportunity? So she is raising this point in, in many ways. Yeah, and I think it's also important to see how she is raising this point through her body. So she is exercising that agency through the very, through the very element that kind of forces her into this victimhood position, where it is because of her golden hair that she fears that men would only love her because of her appearance. And then it is again through her hair and changing that hair color that she is able to exercise some agency. She is able to question men. She is able to question the status quo, question the society. That what if I can change this one thing about myself? What if I don't follow what the beauty standards are? 
and what will happen next? Would men still love me for who I am? Very good. The next point that we're going to deal with is idealism and human existence. That in the third stanza, there's a certain kind of idealism that is posed, which is um, problematic. It may be, it can be seen that Yeats is actually making fun of the text and the old man. Because the old man reads in some text, which the allusion here is to a religious text. Um, and he proves through that text that only God can love you for yourself alone and not your yellow hair. So in a way, Yeats also here is saying that men validate certain points by quoting certain texts, that there is a pact between some kind of texts and men to contain women's agency, yeah. if you like it that way. But um, on the other hand, if we look at Yeats's preoccupation with um, philosophy of life, etc., in a way he is saying that human existence cannot uh, reach the idealism um, that can be reached through divinity, uh, that only God can reach. So our, um, our efforts will always be um, incomplete. <clears throat> Another thing that we need to discuss, Arzu, is who is the narrator, which we have yeah. already seen. Yeah. Who do you think is the narrator of, of this poem? I think it ties up to when you were talking about how the narrator here alludes to this text that the old man is referring to, to prove that only God is capable of loving like that. And how when you mention that men validate other men through these texts and how these texts are also mostly authored by men. And there is this clear power dynamics. So in this context, I think it's very interesting to imagine that the narrator is actually a woman. And how I imagine it is that perhaps the narrator is an older woman talking That's very to... very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So perhaps the narrator is an older woman talking to young Anne Gregory and trying to tease her, trying to explore what she thinks about love, trying to explore what she thinks about affection and trying to comment that um, whatever the society tells you, perhaps you could think beyond that and you could also rebel against these very constricting notions of beauty. And towards the end, with this reference, this very distant reference to this old man who is talking about a text and who is talking about God being the only entity that's capable of loving like that, I think it would be interesting to imagine a woman's voice saying that as taking a jib against all the male authors who have written about a love. Woman narrator who is yeah. making fun yeah. of this old man and yeah. that text. Yeah. yeah, so perhaps a woman narrator is making fun of the old man, making fun of the text, making fun of this claim that human beings are incapable of loving in general, so it's not men's fault. It's a basic human condition, men have no fault here. And only God is capable of that. So it's perhaps unrealistic to hold that expectation of men. Which brings us to um, another point that you mentioned about uh, the internal and this external not being a constructed binary, being a made up binary. Constructed means made up, that we have these false assumptions that there, this binary exists. And so Yeats um, questions this in his own uh, work in another, another work where he says, is the dancer different uh, from dance? Which is, how do you differentiate between the dancer and the, uh, and, and the um, dance? So, um, for example, you love the dancer, but you don't love the dance, it cannot happen, it's a part of their personality. So, um, we will quote from a um, poem over here um, to demonstrate what he was trying to say and, and how it ties in to our discussion. Would you like to read that, Azu? Yeah. Labor is blossoming or dancing where the body is not bruised to pleasure soul, nor beauty born out of its own despair, nor blear-eyed wisdom out of midnight oil. O chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom or the whole? O body swayed to music, O brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? Thank you. 
So friends, you can see, we will not go into the explanation of each and every line of this um, poem, but you can see in the last two lines, O oh, body sway to music, O oh, brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? So how do you differentiate between the dancer and the dance? Um, the dancer is loved because he or she dances. And um, the dance exists, dance is possible because the dancer exists. So you cannot say you love the dance but not the dancer or you love the dancer not the dance. That is the point that Yates is making um, that the inner and the external qualities of, of human beings are tied together. The form and the content are not really different and we have to find some midway instead of thinking in terms of extremes of um, external and internal. So friends, we um, looked at this very beautiful poem for Anne Gregory by William Butler Yeats um, today and had a detailed discussion about it uh, with its themes and various questions um, that were raised in terms of feminism, in terms of understanding love, in terms of understanding various forms of prejudices that we have and so on and so forth. In the second part, um, uh, we'll um, look at some questions that can um, emerge out of this um, poem. Um, so until then, thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you.